Hi everyone, my name is uh, Judy Wellman. I'm president of the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum. Can you all hear me okay? All right, very nice. Uh, the 1816 Quaker Meeting House has a mission statement that emphasizes itself as a national site of conscience and a cornerstone of historic movements for equal rights, social justice, and peace, including rights for Native Americans, African Americans, and women, inviting visitors to explore issues of equality and justice in their own lives. And our program today is the fifth of six programs we have had this year, all of them sponsored and funded by Humanities New York, for which we are very grateful, that help us carry out this kind of mission as we work with people of color, um, African Americans, Native Americans, and, and all kinds of people to begin to think about how we might create a world that we'd all like to live in. So this is a grassroots effort to invest in the future for all of us. Um, we're delighted to work today with the Seneca Art and Culture Center at Ganondagan and to welcome you all here for a very special program by a person I have known. We both are too young to have known each other for as long as we have known each other, Larry and I. So that will give you a clue. And also, Larry has worked with Haudenosaunee people for 50 years. He started when he was in kindergarten. But <laughs> um, as guests of Ganondagan, we would like to take a moment to present them with a gift. And let me see if I can find it first. Uh, MJ, you should come up here. Um, we have been working and briefly starting to dialogue with Ansley and others at Ganondagan about a project to um, transcribe Seneca Quaker manuscripts that are at Swarthmore College in Philadelphia that relate especially to the period after the Treaty of Buffalo Creek. Some of you probably know about the Trail of Tears by which the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Creeks were forced 8,000 people to walk to Oklahoma in the summer of 1838. The federal government thought that worked so well they were going to do the same thing to the Haudenosaunee. So they came up here, negotiated a treaty they called the Treaty of Buffalo Creek, and they got a lot of people to sign off on it until they came to the Seneca who just said, we're not going. And Tonawanda Seneca people asked for a meeting with Quakers at the Farmington Meeting House in 1840, and they began a, a kind of allyship of Quakers for Seneca people that lasted for, well, like some would say maybe to the present. Uh, but uh, the papers are mostly in the 1840s. And M.J. Heisey, who's an 1816 board member, has really begun to do some groundwork to help us work with an advisory committee of people from Ganondagan and also Becky Bowen, who's the archivist for the Seneca Nation, and Jordan Landis, who's the archivist for Swarthmore, to begin a crowdsourced transcription project, which stay tuned because we will need volunteers to work on this, as a way to uh, kind of begin the dialogue or further it. MJ has made some copies of some of the manuscripts, especially ones that have a whole lot of Seneca names on them, because we thought maybe that would be helpful since sometimes we don't know the people, and I'm sure Ansley does know the people. So we'd like, MJ, we'd like to give this to you. Thank you. I'd like to um, introduce Ansley Jemison, who is the cultural liaison here. And he's a member of the Seneca Nation of the Wolf Clan, graduate of Syracuse University, lacrosse player, um, par excellence, degree in communication that he's now using as a um, way to carry out a podcast that's called Original People's Podcast, On Way, On Way. I, I highly recommend it if you're interested in learning more about Native people all across the country. And this is Ansley's joke, not mine. He says he's doing this because he has a face made for radio. So, <laughs> um, I, I give you Ansley Jamerson, who's going to introduce Larry Helpman. Yeah, hey, Judy. 
and also Nyo Iske no Swanwego. Toyo ni Kanonge, Anundawaka ni Ya. My name is Anza Jemison. My, that's my English name. Titoyon is my Ongwehome name, and it means he just entered or he just came. Um, so I'm kind of new here, I guess, uh, back to the site after having even lived here and grown up here quite a bit. Um, coming back to the site, I'm now in a, in a new role as the cultural liaison. Uh, my father did such an amazing job while he was here that they actually had to split his job up into two positions. And uh, Michael Galvin has taken on the role of the site manager and has done a tremendous job. Uh, leading so far, and, and I've taken on another role in terms of the outward-facing cultural liaison role. And um, it's a little bit of a daunting task to take on, you know, a, a position after my father. Um, he's a tough act to follow, I guess you would say. But it's been really um, wonderful to be back in this role, um, you know, trying to figure out a way and looking at different ways as to how we can move forward, continue to tell the stories of indigenous people presently, as opposed to leaving us in the past and the history books and things like that where we tend to be relegated to and um, bring it up to the present and let people know that we are still here. Um, as you notice, we did not do a land acknowledgement um, during the opening of this event here because we believe that those sometimes come off a little bit like a eulogy, almost as if we're no longer a part of the community or no longer here and we are very still much present and uh, we just want to let people know that we are still a active group of people and we do you know, do still impact you all. And I know that there's been a long-standing relationship between uh, the Onondawaka people as well as the Quakers. And it's been wonderful for me to learn more about that history as I've been back here and, um, you know, trying to find ways where we can continue to partner and strengthen this allyship as well. So I thank you for your time today. And I'm going to um, go ahead and I will be your, sort of your MC here, but also be your engineer in the back behind the scenes type of uh, Guy. But it's an honor to welcome today our speaker, Lawrence M. Hauptman, uh, Professor Emeriti at SUNY New Paltz and SUNY Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History. Nationally recognized as a leading scholar of Haudenosaunee history, Professor Hauptman has worked for 50 years on the history of Haudenosaunee and Pequot people. He has published at least 17 books, including Conspiracy of Interests, Iroquois Dispossession, and the Rise of New York State. The Tonawanda Seneca's heroic battle against removal, the United Indian Journey from New York to Wisconsin, 1784 to 1860, and his latest coming full circle, the Seneca Nation of Indians, 1848 to 1934. Larry, how old were you in 1934? <laughs> still, <laughs> still in diapers? <laughs> okay. Four of these are now available in the Ganondagan gift shop. Please enter, exit through the gift shop. Um, he has also given extensive expert witness testimony in court on behalf of the Haudenosaunee land claims to honor his work. Seneca people gave Professor Hoffman the name. Ooh, how would you guess? How would you guess? How would you guess? Yes, and it means interpreter, or he straightens or explains the words. Very important. So, Professor Hoffman talks. Hoffman's talk today: reflection on 50-year journey through Haudenosaunee country, major insights gained about the Six Nations. Emerges form, his lifetime of commitment to Seneca and indigenous people. Please give a warm welcome to our honored colleague, Professor Lawrence <laughs> Thank you. I want to thank uh, the um, Ganondigan staff, Michael and Ainsley and Yvonne for working with Mary Kay Barrett and Judy Wellman on this program. And uh, I'm honored to be here in Mendawaga country, Seneca country. Um, can we go to the first slide? Um, that would be good. Yeah, Larry, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the share screen here for you, and then I'm gonna- Yeah, it's a, it's a privilege to, to work with indigenous people, especially their elders for 50 years. And that's the, honor, that's the honor they gave me, the privilege of working with Native people in New York, in Wisconsin, in Oklahoma, in Ontario, and Quebec. So I, I just want to say that before I begin. David McCulloch once wrote, writing history is like pulling myself under a spell. And this spell, is so real that if I have to leave my work for a few days, I have to work myself back into the spell when I come back. 
It is almost like being hypnotized. And that's, that's how I approach history. I mean, when I first get involved in a project, I, I really can't stop. It's almost like I'm, I've become a fanatic about searching for research materials or documents. But my reflections are clear, you know, in terms of um, understanding Native American history. It took me 10 years before I wrote a book because I had to understand the territory, I understand the people. And as George Kaplan wrote in, in 1841, I found that there are no better people to be found than the Seneca Indians. Uh, I don't mean to insult the, um, the Mohawks, or Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Tuscaroras, you know. But that's what he said. None that I know of that by nature more talented and ingenious, nor any that would be found to be better neighbors. Uh, how ironic, of course, three years earlier, the federal government, in collusion with the state, and with uh, the Ogden Land Company, basically try to remove all Native people from New York. Well, let's go and through this journey that I've, that I've traveled over the last 50 years. Slide one. Okay, so we're on screen one now, Larry. Does that work for you? Now we go to two. This guy here. So, yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about 18 communities that I visit, you know, I visited over the years. And I was invited, you see, I, I went where I was invited. Um, I found a document in the FDR library when I first started at New Paul's, uh, written by a relative of Ainsley's relative, actually, you know. And um, it uh, talked about environmental conditions at the Cattaraugus Indian Reservation. And the fact that the the state uh, was allowing the tanning tanning industry to dump in Cattaraugus Creek, and that letter led me on this journey for fifty years. It was written by a lady by the name of Alice Lee Jemison, as we'll see later in slides. But the next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, we should start with the federal treaty with the Six Nations at Canandaigua on November 11, 1794, because in that letter that I found in the FDR library, she quotes from it basically, and says that the federal government has an obligation to protect, that it has a fiduciary responsibility to native people under article two and article four of the Treaty of Canandaigua, which is celebrated every year, not too far from where we are. And it's commemorated as a treaty that defines the relationship of the United States with the Six Nations. And the obligations are mutual, or they're supposed to be neutral, uh, mutual, excuse me, with um, the Native American communities in New York, along with the federal government. Next slide, please. A lot of my work also is in Wisconsin. A significant amount of work is in Wisconsin, which helps me also explain things to, you know, in terms of the larger picture of uh, Iroquois Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee world. Um, the nation, the largest nation that was removed to at that time, which was considered part of Michigan territory uh, in the 1820s and 1830s. Today, there are approximately 18,000 Oneidas living right next to Green Bay. And in fact, some of the original Green Bay Packers were Oneidas. <laughs> I always like to bring out football. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, another community I, I visited over the years was the Seneca Cayuga Territory in Northeastern um, Oklahoma. Uh, they like to refer to them. So one of the chiefs actually said to me when I first got there, said, you know, Larry, or he called me Dr. Halpman, I don't know, but he called me Dr. Halpman, he said, um, you know, we're the uh, Iroquois at the end of the log. And uh, 
I, yeah, I, I got that. And then I realized that the people, especially from Grand River and from Allegheny would visit and bring their songs out there at the green corn ceremony. And there would be ties back and forth over the years, as well as with the Wisconsin Oneidas. Next, please. Okay. Notice what I'm also saying, and you see on the map, the first map, that, that when we talk about the Haudenosaunee, we should understand that they're transnational peoples. You know, there are other transnational peoples in this world, you know. Um, look at the, uh, the Blackfeet and the Blackfoot, for example, uh, in Montana and Alberta, you know, um, with common threads on both sides of the boundary line, you know, which uh, the Mohawks like to uh, call the boundary line, uh, the line that they sneak under. <laughs> they, they, you know, like they crawl under that, that boundary that affects their lives in awful ways sometimes. Kinship, language, ritual, treaties, and even the course. The views about how jurisdiction should be handled, how they define the state, the province, and two national governments. The views about the Tr Jay Treaty uh, of 1794, November 11, November uh, 19, uh, 1794. Next slide, please. This treaty is, is so important to, to Native people, especially Mohawks and Tuscaroras especially. No duty of entry shall ever be levied by either party on peltries brought by land or inland navigation into the said territories respectively, nor shall the Indians passing or repassing with their own proper goods and effects of whatever nature pay for the same impost or duty, whatever. You know, I was honored by speaking at the Jay Treaty ceremony uh, oh, about 15 years ago. Um, the Jay Treaty, notice, is an Anglo-American treaty. It's an international treaty. And the fact that they mention Native people in the treaty means something more than words to many Native people. And um, this is, as you'll see in the future slides, you'll see how important this is. Next slide, please. This is my most important and actually newest slide that I always like to bring out. This is Descahe, this is Levi General Kihuga Chief in front of the League of Nations in 1923. Please note his presence there, his attorney is on the left carrying a wampum belt, uh, George Decker, and on the right there is a member of this International Bureau, the International Office for the Protection of Native People. What is he carrying there? What is he holding? The two-row wampum, <laughs> you know, this is 1923. So when, Things got difficult at, at Grand River. They would go to the Board of Trade in London or the League of Nations because they wanted to take the Canadian government and the British government before the International Court of Justice for their infringement on sovereign, the native sovereignty. I think this is kind of in, important in terms of looking at native people. That most most non-Indians think of Native people as minority groups. They don't see them th themselves that way. They see themselves as nations, or as uh, President Biden calls them, tribal nations. Notice that. Okay, next slide, please. Now, this is a perfect illustration of the, the transnational reality of Haudenosaunee life. I found this document in the National Archives, it's a marriage certificate in the pension record of Jacob Winnie, Jacob Winnie. His relatives were, were uh, lived on the Cattaraugus Reservation when I went to the Cattaraugus Reservation, met them. But I, I found this, fo this photo in the, in the Cattaraugus Seneca Library, this photo of Jacob Winnie, and it's, it was not identified I had to identify it because Jacob, went, if you looked at the enrollment records of the Seneca, you wouldn't find his name. And yet he enlisted in the Civil War. 
right? So I had to figure out uh, if, I, you know, I, he, could, he could have been a non-Indian for, for all I knew. And I didn't want, I wanted to put a Native American, an indigenous person on the cover of this book on the Civil War. So I traced it back first to the National Archives. And what did I find? I, fi I found his marriage certificate and it, it lists Caledonia, Ontario, and that he was married by an indigenous minister, Isaac Beerfoot at, at Caledonia. And his wife, his wife, by the way, is a Kenjokity from Cataraugus, right? So then what I would do, what I, I see, I was concerned because I didn't, I only found Winnie names at Cataraugus later, later, like in the 1870s and 1880s. They were his children, but I had to find out his identity. And so in a way, I, pr I actually emphasize this reality of the transnational nature of Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee world, putting a, um, a Mohawk, a, a Grand River Mohawk on the cover of a book that largely deals, notice, with a native, native people, indigenous people, south of, this, of the US Canadian boundary. I think that that tells something. It tells something about persistence. It tells something about the reality of indigenous life, a Haudenosaunee life, I think. Next slide, please. Now, I have four principles here in my research. The first one, always question assumptions. One false assumption and logic does the rest. That was a plaque on a, in an antique center in Gardner, New York. And how true that is, it is especially true uh, because the assumptions we have about native people uh, are significantly wrong. Okay, I. F. Stone, the journalist once wrote, never trust the government document totally. <laughs> and you'll see that is the case. Uh, yes, documents tell, a part of history, but there are other ways of looking and examining and seeing what's behind that document. Next slide, please. Second principle, much like doing diplomatic history, you must explore how and why a document was generated. You must also explore both sides of the cultural and political divide. I mean, I was trained in diplomatic history, right? As, um, as a graduate student, I was trained in diplomatic history. I wasn't trained in colonial history. I wasn't trained in um, specifically in Native American history. I became a historian of the Haudenosaunee by experience, by talking to people, by doing archival research and going beyond the document. One prominent historian said, I live and die by the wording in a document. And I replied, don't you have to know whether the author of the document has standing within his or her community and is a representative voice that requires field work as well as genealogical and ar archival research. I, I should, I, I emphasize this because, uh, because this is the way I do, this is the way I work. You know, this is basically looking at it from both sides of the divide, and there sure is a divide historically. Um, yeah, and for, for example, if you go to Washington and go to the archives, most of the most of the letters are written by, you know, I'm not talking about native people, but in general, why do people write to Washington? Well, because they got a complaint, you know what I mean? <laughs> Usually. And some of those people that write write to Washington, I'm not talking about tribal leaders, you know, uh, council chiefs, whatever. But a lot of the people that write have a gripe and some of them are not only, they're not, a, not too sane, some, some of them, you know? You have to understand the communities before you go to Washington to read the documents. Okay, next one, next. Much like doing Civil War history, one must walk the land. And this is, 
this is the one of the more important principles. According to anthropologist Keith Basso, a great anthropologist, the past lies embedded in features of the earth, which together endow their native lands with multiple forms of significance that reach into their lives, Keith Basso. Now, how could you understand the Allegheny Senecas without going down the river? By going down that Allegheny River and understanding the, 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 the places where they gathered medicine, medicinal plants, established communities, um, hunted, fished, whatever. How could you understand that? Or how could you understand Aquasasne without understanding the nature of, of Aquasasne's geography, for example, split by, the, by two larger elephant nations, right? The United States and Canada. How could you understand that? Um, so that is really important. This is how I first understood the Kinsua Dam. When I first went down there, and actually first examined every aspect of the territory. I had gone down there before on several different occasions, but walking the land and going into the national forest and walking in and around the complex at, at the Kinsman. We'll get to that. Next one. Rest, this is the most important. <laughs> to me, this is the most important. Uh, historians have the obligation to share their findings in presentations like I'm doing now, or in other ways with the community where they did their interviews and field work. You can't just take, you know, I, I have a friend, uh, a late friend who died of COVID, a dear friend uh, who, taught me, who taught me so much, who taught me so much. His name was uh, Gordy McLester, L. Gordon McLester III, an Oneida, right? He says, you know, he says, you use us to publish, to, uh, to do research, to get promotion, to get advancement in your career. But just remember, Larry, we also use you. <laughs> and I think I still remember that. that he said that to me, oh, nearly, nearly 40 years ago. And he, he was right, you know, uh, and everything, Everything we do should be to promote community history. You know, if you, it doesn't matter if you're working with native people or you're dealing with uh, uh, Quakers in Syracuse. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. You you have the you have an obligation to share what you what you know, not just collect. You know, not just to gather and you know, uh, but to share. Okay, now we get into the examples. Next one. Uh, Aisley, this is a relative of yours, okay? Alice Lee Jemison was a Seneca journalist and activist from 1900 to 1964. Um, in the and you'll see she was a Cattaraugus Seneca. Her, her uncle was President Cornelius Seneca. If she had money, she would have been a lawyer. If it was the, if it was the better times in which Native Americans were encouraged, she would have been an attorney for the Native American Rights Fund today. That's how that's how smart she was. You know, she she was a syndicated journalist. Okay, in uh, in at a time when this was, to say the least, rare, if not non-existent. Okay, next, next. This is a letter of Ray Jemison, the president of the Seneca Nation, in 1934 which is the National Archives, you can see the citation. Um, it was sent to Washington recommending her, Alice Lee Jemison, for a position in government. Okay, 1934, next, next one. Uh, uh, Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, who was the, you know, FDR Secretary of the Interior, who um, is one of the more famous secretaries of the interior uh, in American history, US history, um, considered to be uh, quite liberal. Uh, he was uh, involved in saving Jews during the Holocaust, for example, much to his credit. But next one, next one. Uh, when he couldn't take criticism, especially by a woman Seneca, you know? 
and a Seneca who had information that was critical of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the 1930s. And so what did he do, not only in his writings, but in his uh, policy um, uh, directives? He basically went after this lady and, call, and sort of associated her with the Nazis, you know, that somehow that uh, her criticism was a way for the Nazis, both in the United States and in Germany, to placate, to uh, minimize what the, the Germans were doing to Jews in Germany, you know? Uh, this, is the, this is the way he handled it, right? So I, I find this letter in the, in the FDR library, this wonderful four page letter in which she talks about how FDR has a, writing to the president, has a responsibility to deal with the environmental crisis at the Cattaraugus Indian Reservation based on the Treaty of Canandaigua in 1794, in November 1794. So I say to myself, this is, this is the first month I'm at the college at New Paltz. I said to myself, what is this? What is this? You know, my, my family are you know, very, very pro F, uh, FDR, pro New Deal, you know, and I'm saying, what is this? What, who is this native woman? You know, I wonder why is she writing this? So, and then I, then I find letters by her all over the place. Next slide. Then I also find out that I find a picture like this, you know, um, a picture with Elnora Seneca, a graduate of Hampton Institute, Cornelia Seneca, uh, three times president of the Seneca Nation and well-respected Cattaraugus Seneca, and the picture of Alice Lee Jemison in 1948 in front of the Smithsonian Castle. <laughs> I said, well, what is this? You know, um, right. Um, then I realized what she was doing. She was a lobbyist for the Seneca Nation in Washington, unofficially without any money, except the money she raises from writing and from donations, okay? Take money, whatever. And of course, you know, in those days, you didn't necessarily look to where you got the money and what, the, you know, whatever, okay? So, so what happens? I'm taken before the corner. I, I, I write to my friends at Cattaraugus and they invite me to Cattaraugus. And I'm taken before three women and I'll tell you their names, you know, Norma Kennedy, Winnie Kennel, and Marilyn Anderson, okay? The late Norma Kennedy, wonderful person, Winnie Kennel, wonderful. You know? And of course, Marilyn who's wonderful as well. And, has done good work in terms of promoting genealogy at Cattaraugus. So I find this picture. I said, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. This doesn't make any sense to me, you know. So I, uh, I, I, I actually write. I actually ask them, do you, is there a relative of Alice Jemison alive today that I could talk to? And so they give me the address of his, of her daughter. Look at this. Next, next slide, next slide. Her daughter, okay, is Jean Marie Jemison, now deceased. There, my wife is on the right. Jean Marie Jemison is in, uh, with the pink uh, uh, in the center, towards the center, me. And then my other, uh, uh, the, the, the Seneca woman who actually watched over me for many years, Ramona Charles of Tonawanda, right? Um, in any case, I find her and she tells me this story, you know, she tells me, she says, I try to get the FBI file to see what, what was there. There must be an FBI file, she said. So I said, well, would you mind if I got the FBI file? <laughs> um, and of course, I went through the next slide. I went through the, the FBI, they, they gave me a number uh, of 60,000 431. The next slide, too. If you go to the next slide, next slide. The same, same thing. Okay. And I, of course, a, a historian is impatient. You know, he's in a trance, right? 
So he said, so how do you get this? How do you get the FBI file fast? You know, um, in the 70s, it wasn't as hard as it is in some, in some cases today. But, uh, but I wasn't waiting for three years to get an FBI file, right? Right, and uh, right, uh, okay. So I, I call my congressman, Matt McHugh, the congressman, and I say, I say to his assistant, you know, I contribute to your campaign. I don't tell you, tell them they only give a dollar, you know, but I, I give, so could you help me get this file fast? Well, the, F, the FBI, in those, you see the FBI in those days, unlike today, were, were seen as the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy, you know, during the Nixon, post-Nixon period. So they were willing to cough up more material than they are in, in later times, you know. So I finally got the FBI file with the help of Alice Jemison, uh, his daughter, Jean, and we saw, and this is what it said. Next slide. Next slide. This is her FBI file, okay? Uh, you'll see that it said that um, in the FBI file, that there, uh, it says no for a check of the attorney general's list than that of the House Committee of Un-American Activities fails to indicate that Alice Jemison's organization, the American Indian Federation, has been cited either of them as subversive. No further investigation will be conducted in this case unless advised to the contrary by the Bureau. Okay, notice that. So why is she under investigation? Why is she being followed? You know, and then Alice Jemison, this journalist, has this sense of humor. You know, she fills out the FBI file. Um, uh, the she have she, this uh, not FBI, but the uh, employment file because she becomes a government worker. She's even hired by the United States government in the agriculture department during the Amer during the uh, World War II and after. She becomes a, a federal employee, you know? So uh, if she's a Nazi, I don't think she could become uh, a member of the federal government during World War II, right? In any case, look what it said. Look, her sense, she has a sense of humor when she fills out her employment record. What other name are you noted for? And she says, Poco, you know? Uh, that's a, of course, uh, the idea that she's stereotyped Pocahontas, you know. So she puts that down because she's, you know, she resents that. Then she also says, what or what political what organizations do you belong to? As if she's gonna put down the Communist Party or whatever, you know. What she puts down is the Cat Fanciers Association. I mean, you know, give me a break here, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, next slide, please. Okay, Th that's one. That's the, that's the first story in the journey. What I just told you started in 1971, right? Now it took me ten years to tell the full story. 1981, my first book, The Iroquois in the Civil War, was called. Okay, you know you can't just write. You know, I mean, you, know, you have to you have to understand things. You know, and then the next one of the earlier one of the later works. I'm reading a book by the famous historian Stephen Ambrose, okay, very well known Pulitzer Prize winning uh, historian. And his first book was called A Wisconsin Boy in Dixie, and edited by Stephen Ambrose, then at the University of Wisconsin. And he, he writes about this, uh, he, this regiment that is the 14th Wisconsin K Company. And he talks about you would not believe how many ways we can cook our corn so as to have a variety. We have parched corn, boiled, mush, corn, coffee, but the latest invention, notice the latest invention to make it go down is half parch it, then grind it coarse like hominy, and then boil it with a small piece of pork in season. That's, uh, <laughs> okay, if you have to live on corn altogether by reason of this year's, this war is continuing, for a great length of time, I advise you to cook it in the way I last mentioned. So, okay, I'm reading a book and I'm saying, gee, I ate that, didn't I? Yeah, I think I ate it last week. Yeah, and on and Oneida. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, James 
James Newton was lieutenant in a company, K Company, 14th Wisconsin, fought at uh, uh, the, uh, the Battle of Atlanta. There were Oneidas with him there, okay. Um, he was a non-Indian who lived right off the Wisconsin Oneida Reservation in Wisconsin. But what he doesn't tell you is that in the 14th Wisconsin, there were 39 Oneidas and about 10 Stockbridge. <laughs> so, I mean, if I hadn't eaten that last week, you know, if I hadn't under, you know, eaten that at the Oneida Reservation, then I looked and of course I see the same recipe in the Jesuit relations, you know, <laughs> described, you know, whatever. And of course I had it at the fall festival at Cataraugus, you know. Uh, whatever. See, so when, when I'm, what I'm getting at is that how would you know that that's, that's Haudenosaunee? How do, would you know? How would you, unless you had some fieldwork, contact, relationship in some cases. That, that's part of my journey. Okay. Uh, next. Next. Ah. Uh, some of you from Syracuse might recognize this photograph. It's in the Onondaga Historical Association. Uh, it was taken in the 100th anniversary of the American Revolution uh, by Phil Ryder, a local uh, photographer. And it's on the wall there in the Onondaga Historical Association. This is uh, Dinah John Onondaga. Uh, she's one of the most respected elders of the, of the 19th century. She got a, uh, a longhouse funeral and also a, um, a Methodist funeral as well when she died in 1883. But her story is remarkable. Um, one Mohawk fellow said to me, oh yeah, I remember uh, reading or hearing about Dinah John. Yeah, she was in the War of 18, she was in the Civil War. I said, well, yeah, I, don't, actually, I don't think that's right. You know? But so I wanted to find out about her life. And so how did I do? I mean, there are newspaper articles galore in the Onondaga Historical Association about her, you know, in the Syracuse newspapers. Um, well, I had to go to the, to, to, to the records, you know, to, so I, I found, I looked at the War of 1812 records and I found something kind of interesting, you know, when you think about it here, um, I found five Native women, Haudenosaunee women, Haudenosaunee women, who were in the War of 1812, who received pensions. Okay, five. Okay, and they're listed wrongly as cooks. There were more than cooks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, and uh, they were Onondagas, there's Oneidas, and okay, and Seneca's right. These three, these five women. So I became curious about her because the story is that she went from the reservation to the commercial center of Syracuse every day, you know, five times a week with her baskets and her sassafras to sell. And, every, and often the newspapers in Syracuse would report, you know, report that, that she was there. When she was not there, they were worried about her actually, but notice, until the age of 90, almost 90, she's walking miles from the res to, you know, down to the commercial center there, okay? And back, right? Selling baskets. And she became a celebrity in Syracuse, but she knew how to navigate, see? Notice what women here in uh, at the Anadaga Reservation, for example, they knew, they knew how to navigate. You know? Ima imagine, Imagine the reaction when Onondaga men were going to Syracuse. There would be a little, the women had a way of navigating the world in that particular time. And she, she made small talk, whatever, and she, she could speak a little English a little bit, you know, and uh, she knew, how, of course, how to sell baskets and market her baskets, the like. But in any case, um, so she applies for a pension. Her, her husband dies in 1857, 
And so she applies for a pension because she and her husband went to war in 1812 and the, the pensions became more liberal over the time. And so she applied for one. Well, they denied it. Why did they deny it? <laughs> they denied it. Well, because she's not a citizen. <laughs> She, okay, then she applied again. She she got a, a, a like a certificate from the chiefs, telling you know whether that she was uh, eligible, whatever. Um, and she went down. She asked for a pension again. Oh no, you can, you you can, we won't give you a pension because uh, you didn't take the oath, <laughs> oath of allegiance, whatever. Okay, finally the the. Pension laws liberal, liberalized, and so she applied later, but she was smart enough. Notice she, she went to Buffalo and got other attorneys. You know, uh, she, so she, she not only went to the chiefs, she went to local attorneys. She went as far as Buffalo to get attorneys to help her, right? So finally, in 1878, she gets a pension, $400 pension, right? And then soon after she dies. But what I'm the story here is that you know she's listed as a cook. She's not a cook, you know. Some of the some of the I'm not saying she, but some of those women that went to the war, they were clan mothers, they're clan matrons, you know. They were watching over, because after all, remember what's happening in the War of 1812. It's a it's a it's a war again among Haudenosaunee people between the Grand River and. Tuscarora in New York and Seneca in New York and, you know, others trying to, they're fighting each other again, much to the harm of their own uh, world. Okay, so that's the story. Next one. Next one. Uh, now, this is a very in, in, uh, interesting story, too. I wrote a book in 1986 called The Iroquois Struggle for Survival. And, you know, I, I talked about the Tuscarora Reservoir. I talked about the St. Lawrence Seaway Project. I talked about the Kinswood Dam. But I wasn't, I mean, I had contact with Senecas for years, but I, I only told part of the story there. Because I only, so what happened, I was hired to do some research for the Seneca Nation in 2010 actually for years, on what's called the uh, relicensing of the Kinsua Dam project. So um, I went with hydrologists and with uh, 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 Tyler Heron, the son of George Heron, who was the president of the Seneca Nation at this time. And we took a tour of this area near the dam. And I had never seen this before because it was hidden in the Allegheny National Forest, the upper reservoir on the left, if you see the upper reservoir on the left, I had always seen the lower reservoir, reservoir that, the, uh, that the Army Corps made into like the lake, the Lake of Perfidy, Allegheny Lake there. And so I, I, I began to realize I was with these hydrologists and I began to see that there was another story here. Another, another complete story that I had missed because I didn't follow my nose and travel every aspect of not only on the res, but around the res. And there was the upper reservoir. Why is that important? Because what it was, it, it taught, it showed me, and with these hydrologists' help, it showed me what a pump storage system worked how it works. It showed me that, that this project was not simply for flood control, that this was to promote hydropower. That you know, the argument that the army used was we have to help the downriver communities as far as Pittsburgh. And what was there was also hydropower, turbines, to produce hydropower for Penelec Company that started as a small coal company in the 1930s and now is First Energy, the fourth largest energy company in the a private company in, in the United States, based in Cleveland, right? 
the federal government leased the dam for hydropower for something like $250,000 a year, you know, uh, when the reality is that that Penelec and then later First Energy Corporation was making millions and millions of dollars uh, and providing uh, the shareholders with uh, stock uh, improvements every, every quarter, whatever. So there, walking the land tells me the whole, a, a larger story, you know, a larger story. And I had, I had to, I had to see it for myself because, you know, I had seen the dam before, you know, I'm somewhere I hadn't seen the dam. I had seen the lower reservoir before, the, the, the lower reservoir, the Allegheny Lake there. And I had heard the stories from the elders for years about, about the, the, the horror of this project. You know, I had interviewed anthropologists who had worked with the Seneca's at that time, you know, but I hadn't walked the land completely, see? So notice history often is incomplete and it has to be continued to be done, re-read, understood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is one of my favorites. My this is in New York Oneida, long before the present situation. Please note, I mean, this is <laughs> this is be well before uh, the present. Okay, the Oneidas most most Oneidas were to live on Onondaga. You know, uh, most Oneida they had they they had thirty two acres left. The Hanyos family had thirty two acres left of the West Road Reservation. Okay. Uh, that reservation. This man helped save it, <laughs> helped save the 32 acres because it, it was, it could have been taken away in 1919, 1920. He brought it to court along with his lawyer, George Decker. But what's so interesting, one false assumption, logic does the rest. Well, I heard about this fellow before because he, the Oneidas talked about this, this inventor, uh, Chapman Skinnerdell. And I said, what, inventor? I, well, you know, um, I, I had never thought of American Indians in science and technology. I never thought of that. Well, this fellow and his brother, now this, what, this story is an important story, really. He and his brother, Chapman and his brother, okay, were Albert, his brother's name, Albert, um, were two extraordinary people. They, they were fascinated by trains. They were fascinated by mechanics, okay? Um, they grew up on the 32 acres, okay? And they saw the, the world shrinking. And um, actually they ended up at, at Onondaga until the land was returned and confirmed by federal treaty, federal uh, court decision in 1919, 1920. Now, what's extraordinary about Chapman Skinner, though, is um, if you looked at his life, I mean, this picture is from the Smithsonian, you know. Uh, he, he was a chief. They had uh, actually five, five um, they had several divisions within the Oneidas in New York at that particular time. This is not the uh, leadership that came in after 1975. This was pre pre uh, Pre Maisie, pre Cobbritter, you know, pre all that. In any case, so what does he do? He joins the Navy after because he he works in the Navy yards in Hampton Roads because he goes to Hampton. He's a graduate of Hampton, you know, honored uh, advanced student at Hampton Institute, which is right next to the the the, the uh, shipyards. Okay, so he joins the Navy thinking that's a way to make some money, bring back home, then retire from the 32 acres. What does he do? He, he's an inventor. So he starts off with uh, gun sights <laughs> on ships, right? 
but he doesn't he doesn't patent that he does he doesn't patent that you know the idea of gutter sites uh, for naval ships but he he produces the, all, a lot of the work that becomes these gun sites on naval ships then he gets the idea as a sailor as you see he gets the idea which is remarkable he says well you know when I'm up, when I'm up in the crow's nest I can't hear what's going on on the deck and they shout and I can't hear up there because of the wind and the waves. So he invents something and he patents it. Uh, an audio phone, which can, you can communicate from the crow's nest to the deck and deck to the crow's nest. And it's patented. Okay. Then, <laughs> then he gets in, he, you know, he's too old to enlist in World War I. So he works in a, a defense factory that deals with explosives in Philadelphia, Frankfurt, uh, it's called Frankfurt Arsenal. So he becomes fascinated with explosives, but he doesn't want it to be used in war. He is not looking for that, this horror of World War I. He's really taken back by that. He begins to use explosives to establish compounds, compounding. Right, he he actually gets another patent on that, and the, what he gathered the native people at Onondaga, you know, the the Onondagas and Rai is living there. They they say I've heard this story that they used to come out and go into an area isolated part of the res, where he would give demonstrations of these explosives. <laughs> this he became part of the entertainment at Onondaga. You know, I think that's great, you know. See, but notice, you have to open up your mind. You know, uh, one Mohawk said to me, you know, uh, ladies, you know, come up to me and ask me, um, this Mohawk fellow who I know quite well, he said, um, they asked me, what medium do I do, do I do my art in? You know, what medium? You know? And he, he says to them, I can't draw a straight line. What do they want? They think all well, Native people are artists, you know. I, that, that that statement is for the people at Gananda <laughs> just so that you 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 could understand. Uh, that was Adrian Cook, by the way, that gave me that uh, that expression. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have to cite the, the people. Next slide, please. Yeah, here's another. Uh, you know, uh, one false assumption: logic does the rest. Well, the first Oneida priest is also one of their great chiefs. <laughs> you know. This is sort of thing. See, when the Oneidas went out to Wisconsin, you know, they didn't take a, a Mayflower van lines or North American van lines. They they went right before they were going to be removed anyway, you know. So they ended up in Michigan territory, Green Bay. You know? And um, one of the leaders in the late 19th century was Cornelius Hill, who become who is uh, see to be a leader in Oneida in Wisconsin until the Longhouse was founded in 1970. Longhouse was established in 1970. You had to be a member of the Vestry Council of the Episcopal Church. There was a minority group of uh, a Methodists, yes, and there was a few Catholics, yes, and a few Mormons, but not too many. But um, but the majority of people at the Res before 1970 were members of the Episcopal Church. And the interesting thing about that is the the um, the church the Episcopal Church considers their the uh, uh, the the church building at Oneida because it's so beautiful it's a beautiful church uh, the native cathedral of the Episcopal Church which of course is you know it's one full assumption and logic does the rest okay next Professor Elvin five minutes left here. Okay, I'm almost ready. Okay, okay. we'll get down. Okay. What is tradition? Well, I mean, a new tradition is Oneida Indian lace making. You go to the museum at Oneida, introduced by Episcopal missionaries, uh, Sybil Carter. Next, next. Uh, Oneida singers sing in Oneida, and even one, you know, the, the hymn, they're sing their Episcopal hymns in Oneida and won the National Endowment of 
the Arts Award. Next, please. Next, okay. This is the great honor I received in, from Haudenosaunee people speaking at the lease hearings in 1990. Bring the knowledge I gained working with Native people to deal with the Salamanca lease. That's uh, Amory Houghton on the left and Dennis Lay on the right and uh, younger Larry Houghton in the middle. Next one. This is the last slide, but I dedicate it uh, to my late friend who taught me everything. We went, we went all around. We went to the University of Indiana. We went to University of Wisconsin. We went to Madison to the Historical Society. But this, for 40 years, we joined hands in research. He was the inside man because he knew and he was a tribal secretary of the Oneidas, you know? He was the inside man, and I was the outside man. I was the archival nerd who would go to Washington, you know? But, you know, that's, that's the way it was. And I, ben I benefited more than just doing research with this person. He was like, he was like my brother, you know? And um, so I dedicate what I said today to his memory. And I thank you, uh, Nyawe, Yahweh for inviting me to, to this, um, to Ganondagan. And I, I thank uh, the Haudenosaunee people for allowing me to come into their community and do this work because I, I could not have done it without, as you see, it was a sharing responsibility, sharing uh, duty that, you know, sharing uh, work and, uh, and trying to piece things together. And um, you know, I'm better for it, and I hope I hope I help. No way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Larry. We are so to have you. This was really thrilling. I just can't, I'm just so, so happy you were willing to do this and we're going to spread this around on the web and hope more people hear it as well. If we could somehow turn the light on for a minute, are you willing to take some questions? Yeah, I can't hear, I can't hear you that well. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay. You have to, uh, okay, thank you very much. Anyone have a question you'd like to ask, Professor Hauptman? I have one. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, are you going to write more books? Are you going to write more books, Larry? No, I can't. Uh, I, I, I am writing. I still write. I still write articles and, um, and also uh, I do reviews and give talks. And, um, but I can't. Uh, the reason I can't do it is that notice the title of my last book was Coming Full Circle. I started with I was Jemison in the 1930s and I end this the Seneca book Coming Full Circle with a with the New Deal too. Um, no, I can't. Uh, my eyesight isn't good enough and my hearing, my left I have no I have limited hearing in my left my in the right ear. So I no I, but I'm still I'm still active. I have to give I have to give a presentation. I hope somebody come to the Iroquois Conference, which uh, you know, uh, October fourteenth and fifteenth, um, went down at Allegheny, and um, I'm also giving a talk on this Saturday, come out next Saturday, October eighth, at the Erie Canal Museum, and I'm also giving a talk. A talk um, I think it's either October 29th or thirtieth at the New York History Conference at Orianta. But that, you know, I, these are all Zoom talks. I, I just can't do that anymore. Um, you know, I know my, I, I, that doesn't mean that, you know, if I, someone wants, needs some research, or whatever, I'll be happy to do research, but I just can't, I can't. I mean, writing a book is quite hard. I mean, I did it for so many years, and, and now, you know, there are, there are good people out there that are, that are you know, when I started, you have to understand that, that there were only there were only three of us in the state. Three, three historians were teaching courses on um, 
on indigenous peoples, just three history, historians, okay? I can mention that, you know? Is that you've, already, you've already written 17 books, so that's quite a, a remarkable contribution. <laughs> All right, well, I have one more question here. Sure. Who were the three historians that you started with, Larry? Uh, William T. Hagen at Fredonia, who was really like a mentor to me at Fredonia. Every time I wanted to go to Catalonia, see, I, I introduced him to the Senecas. <laughs> he, he taught at Fredonia, but he only had Senecas in his class and didn't know, didn't know too much. And he, but he was a wonderful historian. He wrote about the Kiowas and Comanches, you know, and he wonderful. I mean, terrific. And then there's Bob Venables was at Oswego at that time. And the, the three of us were the only historians are, uh, get, are giving courses within SUNY on native, on indigenous peoples. Which, um, see, the, there are other people too that I should th thank. There was a, uh, there was a, a fellow by the name of Donald Berthelon at, at Indiana University who, who dealt with the Arapahoes. And he, he said to me, well, at, the, at one of the con earliest conferences, 1971, in, um, I think it was the American Historical Association, he said, you know, you should go out in the field. I said, you know, then he said, you know, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. You know, I said, well, you know, I, I, thank, thank God, my, you know, my father was a schmoozer. He knew how to, he knew how to talk and, you know, to talk to, to uh, make people feel comfortable talking, you know, and um, so I guess I take that yeah. from, from him. Okay. Well, so I'm going to ask if there's one more question for Professor Hoffman. Uh, actually, there are two. If you could take two, yes, go ahead, Maggie. Okay. Uh, mine is not a question, it can be brief. And I want to thank Professor Hoffman for telling this presentation in stories. Stories are the most powerful. Yay. Thank you for telling your stories and sharing your information. In story form. In story form, so appreciate the, the, uh, the tales. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Chapman Skinnerdo and his brother Albert did was to investigate the pollution in uh, Onondaga Lake, which is remarkable. In the 1920s, they tried to figure out a, a way to deal with that contamination. Okay? And, um, you know, the, nobody gave them any help, they, but they tried. They actually uh, went about it. In, and if, you know, I, I mentioned that in my book, actually, on the on Chapman skin. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, they did make the salt, uh, that's true. But when they, um, the Treaty of 1788, in which they gave, the Onondagas gave up, I shouldn't use, seeded, that's in, in quotation marks, right? Seeded Onondaga Lake, you know, that, which they, you know, right, the fraudulent treaty of 1788. They, uh, of course, they gave the, they gave the, uh, the state, uh, the marshes around the lake, right? You know, so, uh, but uh, it was as funny as you can get those treaties, you know, the state treaties. So, um, yeah, they didn't, they didn't eat the soil, but I should have mentioned that Chapman Skinner was, was what, a person who Okay. 
Yes. A couple more announcements. One is, if you haven't yet joined the non again too, so it's a wonderful place to be a part of. And two, there will be another program called Concerts with the non again in the 1860 House here on November 12th, Saturday, 2 o'clock. Marissa Coleman Manitowabi is going to talk about issues relating to the teaching of Haudenosaunee history to elementary school kids. So we invite you especially to come and bring friends, especially people who might be teachers. And um, I want to remind you of Ken and 